our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So it was the end of the school year, and the kindergarten teacher was receiving gifts from all of her students. The florist son handed her a gift. She shook it, held it over her head, and said, I bet I know what it is. It's some flowers. That's right, the boy said. About how did you know? Oh, just a wild guess, she said. The next pupil was the candy shop owner's daughter. The teacher held her gift over her head, shook it, and said, I bet I can guess what it is. It's a box of sweets. That's right. How did you know? asked the girl. Oh, it's just a wild guess, said the teacher. The next gift was from the son of the liquor store owner. <laughs> the teacher held the package overhead, but it was leaking. She touched a drop of the leakage with her finger and touched it to her tongue. Is it wine? she asked. No, the boy replied with some excitement. The teacher repeated the process, taking a longer, larger drop of leakage to her tongue. Is it champagne? she asked. No, the boy replied. The teacher took one more taste before declaring, I give up. What is it? With great glee, the boy replied, it's a puppy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're frowning. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, yeah. Okay. You're gonna tell that joke three times this year. I can tell. <laughs> I had to give a good joke this morning because this morning we are entering into that, well, we've been into this, this whole chapter in 1 Peter, which has that, that has what I call the S word in it, over and over and over, submit, submit. It's on the cover of your, and I, and I just want to blame Carol for that because I didn't tell her to do that, she put it there, but anyway, it's that process of Understanding our place is to look out for the interests of other people. And that's, that's, that sets us apart from the world, really. Our job is to be different than the world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, he starts this section by saying, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And one of those sinful desires is the pride that we have and the, and the idea that, well, we should get everything, everything should be about me. Everything should be about who I am. And, and that's part of the sinful desires that we talk about, whether it's greed or lust or just the desire for other people to do things for us rather than the other way around. And that's really the whole idea behind this, this thing of submission, that we don't focus on our own interests and our own ideas, but we focus on what other people are doing. And he says, dear friends, he starts off, he has to say dear friends because he's going to say some really hard things <laughs> to people. And, and we're going to get today, just look forward to it. There's going to be some more hard things today. And then he says, I urge you, because I can, he doesn't say I command you. I noticed that when we would read this. Because it really has to be a voluntary thing. You really, ha you have to decide to be a servant. Mm -hmm. If I tell you to do it, then it's just, it's just a different process. That's what God does with his rules, we'll call them, or laws, or the commandments. He's really saying to you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, here's how you should live. But God says, I'm not going to... <coughs> I'm not going to come down heavy on you. I'm just going to urge you to do this. This is the way you need to live. This is the way you need to act. And then that third part, foreigners and exiles. That means we're living in a world where this isn't common. This isn't the way the world lives. This isn't the way they do things. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be the ones that 
give in to other people. That's not even the right way to put it. We are the ones who should be really looking out for the interests of other people. What's best for you is what we should be thinking. Regardless, and this is the problem, is, is that Jesus keeps saying things like, well, it's not just your friends you're supposed to do that with. You're supposed to do that with your enemies. Even Republicans? Even <laughs> Democrats? Even, just fill in your own word there. And the answer is, yeah. Yeah. That's the way we're supposed to do it. And so for this, um, I just wanted to turn over to Hebrews 11, which is just a few pages over here. And it's not something that God just started doing now. It's something that God has pointed out, or this, this picture of being foreigners and exiles is something that God has had, um, is part of being a, man, a person of faith, and it's always been that way. In Hebrews 11, which is a, it's a chapter about all the, the heroes of the faith from the Old Testament. And in there he says, in chapter, starting in verse 13, he says, All these people, all these people, being the David and Moses and Abraham and Sarah and all those people in the Old Testament. He says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were, and there's the words, foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. See, when we look at ourselves as foreigners and strangers, and then we try to live that way, we're doing that. We're saying, this isn't our country. Our country is something different. And we are trying to live like we're there rather than here. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, and this is the verse that I've been thinking about this week. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. See, when we live by faith, when we live as foreigners and exiles, when we follow the things that God says, then God is not ashamed to be our God. I mean, sometimes you just think, well, wait a minute. Well, God loves me regardless, right? Well, there's a truth there. But at the same time, there's the idea that we're supposed to live in a way where God says, yeah, this is mine. This person's mine. This is, this is, this is a person that I, I just enjoy being around. And that's, that aspect of it is something that I think that Honestly, a lot of Christians in our world don't think of it that way. Does God really like the way that I'm living? And then we read First Peter and we go, hmm, not so much. Doesn't mean that if you fail, it doesn't mean that if what you did yesterday kind of disqualifies you for something. That's not the point. The point is, I should be living in a way that brings honor and glory to God, and that when God live, looks at me, He approves of what I'm doing. And that is what Peter, I mean, Peter, we, we've talked about this before, when you look at Peter's life, there's lots of things that he did that were just a little, <laughs> no, they weren't a little, they were a lot contrary to God. I mean, Peter, the, the person writing this is the guy that when the when push came to shove, when the rubber met the road, he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And that's the the, the thing that Peter had to live with. Peter lives with it because when Jesus rose again, Jesus comes to him and says, Peter, it's okay. What's happened in the past is past. Let's get up this morning and today live right. Mm -hmm. Today is a new day. You can be what God wants you to be. And that's what Peter, that's the lesson that Peter had to learn. And that's what he's passing on here. But while he's passing them on, he really does get in, um, he, gets, he gets preachers into trouble. That's what he does. Because we're going to jump, we, we just read 1 Peter 2, we're going to go back to Peter now. And then in 1 Peter, we're starting chapter 3. And chapter 3, verse 1, is every woman's favorite verse. Or I should say, maybe I should say, it's every husband's favorite verse. There's a lot of heads going up and down like this. A lot of people are looking at me like, what? So, in 1 Peter 3, in verse 1, it's the first word is wives. wives. Let's just go on from there. 
It says wives, yeah. And so I, a lot of times I'll stop right here and just say this. There are very few times when I say this, but a lot of times I do this just because the, uh, because the men in the room, particularly husbands who are in here, are thinking, yeah, God, go get them. Go get them. Yeah, let's, you, need to, you need to preach to them right now. And what I always say is, is that as a general rule, if it says wives, then men, you can, I'm giving you permission not to listen for the next few minutes. Because this isn't written to you. This isn't written to anybody who is not a wife, like not a woman. This is written to them. You, at this point, I'm giving you permission. You can think about the football game later today. You can think about that job you got at home that you need to do. You can think about whatever you want. Just don't even read this stuff because it's not about you. It's about wives. And I, and I say that knowing that every man in here is going to listen more close to anyway, because they want to know what is it that your wives are supposed to do. So it says wives, and then it says in the same way, submit, and there's the S word, in the same, in the same way as what? Well, we've been talking about the last two weeks, we keep coming, the first it starts with submit to every human authority, so it starts very general. Submit to every human, and, we, and right before the election, we talked about the government. You remember all that? Go on YouTube and watch the sermon, because I'm not going to talk about it today. But <laughs> the whole point is, it's very general. So everybody submit to, and then the next, uh, next section starts with slaves, in reverent fear, submit. So it gets, it gets into more of a social class, so more of a, of, a, of a, it's more personal, but it's more direct. I mean, the human, human authorities are people that are not anywhere near us, right? We don't know them personally, mostly. But, but slaves and masters, we do. And then here in this third part, it gets even more personal. He starts talking about your relationship, the person that you live with. And so submit generally to the government, then submit in, a, in your community to people that you know, and now focusing on submit to People in your house, put it a different way. And so, Peter has gone from preaching, and he's gone to meddling, <laughs> as they say. Because now, it's like, oh, you mean, wait a minute, this, this person right here? Slides in the same way. So I want to just remind you real quick about some of the things that we talked about over the other submission weeks. By the way, this is the third week of submission. We're not going to talk about submission next week. Amen. <laughs> well, apparently, most of you think submission is a good topic. We should keep talking about it. Anyway, we'll just go. Wives in the same way. So, biblical submission is, and we're, I'm just going to list some of the things that we talked about, is a voluntary surrender of one's own interest to the interest of another. I'm giving up my right so that you will benefit. That's what submission is. Biblical submission shows the difference between us and them. We practice submission. They don't. Biblical submission is about me and not the one submitted to. Talks about, and Peter talks about cruel masters in, in the previous week. Talk, and you still have to obey them. You still have to submit to them. Uh, biblical submission is following the example of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter points to. He says, look, Jesus did it. Jesus submitted to these people and they killed him. Mm -hmm. Now you be like Jesus. I don't like it when he says that. Huh? Mm -hmm. But I thought, maybe, maybe Jesus did it. No, I don't have to. And that's not the philosophy. The philosophy is we do what Jesus did when we face these situations. Biblical submission is an act of faith and trust in God. I'm trusting that God will carry me through this, even if I have to set aside my own interests to pursue the interests of another person. And that's, you know, last week we ended with that idea that, let's face it, the Christian life is hard. God's not asking something easy. He says, you, you, I, I'll give you all the strength, all the wisdom, all the things that you need to follow my will for you, but understand that my will for you can be very difficult. You may have to change your life. You may have to do things different. You may have, I mean, come on. Isn't 
Christianity just all about health and wealth and good times and everything's happy and we're all and then Peter and Jesus and God and they start meddling in our lives and telling us that we gotta do this and we gotta do that and we were and I'm telling you that this is I'm, I'm urging you to listen to the words of Peter. Listen to the words of God. And and it goes back to because most weeks we somebody brings up, let's pray for our country. Okay, well it starts with us. What are we going to do to look out for the interests of other people? And that's a hard question. And that's hard to do. And you're going to have to sit there and listen to it for a few more minutes, okay? Because I haven't even started yet. Preach on. Preach on. So, going back to 1 Peter 3, starting at 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. You realize that the general principle about our lives is, is that if we want people to put their faith in Christ, then we have to show them what it means to live the life of Christ. You can't just tell them. You have to show them. And that's what Peter does. In fact, that's something that's a kind of a theme all the way through uh, Peter, is this idea that our behavior is the number one way in which we testify to other people. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. If we're just like them, if we treat people just like they do, why should they come to Christ? They should look at us and say, well, wait a minute, those people are kind of the Earlier on, there's the about God's special possession, and the King James uses the word peculiar there. <laughs> Those people are peculiar. They're weird. They do, they do weird stuff. They forgive people. They're merciful. They, they, they live in submission to other people. They look out for other people's interests. They don't care about where I'm from or who I am. They still live the life of Christ. They follow what God is telling them to do. They keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Even when we treat them horribly, yeah. or badly, or persecute them. See, we like to say, no, no, no. See, our world, all you have to do is watch any kind of action movie that's out there, and I watch a lot of them. And what you <laughs> always see is, somebody treats me wrong, so what I do is, I go get them. That's what the world does. But God says, no. Even if somebody treats you wrongly, you still have to live the life that God wants us to live. We're going to get into some of those things in a minute. So this whole idea then is that it ties into this, this whole philosophy is your actions need to be reflective of what you believe. And because of the, uh, I'm just going to say it this way. The gospel is a problem for people. Try to live without creating more problems. <laughs> That's what Peter is talking about. Culturally, when, when in those days, the wives, if, if a wife was, when, when you got married, the wife was expected to take on the faith or the religious practices of the husband. Really, of the family, but that's the point. And so, Peter doesn't tell them that, but Peter says, if, but in every other way, you need to be a respectful wife. You need to live with them in the best possible way. Why? Because you can't worship the way they do, and that's going to be a problem. So don't make more problems. Don't create more waves. Don't give people an excuse not to believe. And that's Peter's, that's Peter's philosophy here. In 1 Corinthians um, chapter 9, Paul, a different apostle, says this, starting in verse 19. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I am free from all those cultural things. I'm free from all the things I just talked about with wives and husbands. I'm free from that. But I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. 
To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law. Although I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am in the cross. Sometimes Paul's very confusing, right? <laughs> so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do not. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Mm -hmm. If I have to do something because you like it that way, then as long as it's not going against God's law, yeah. then I do it. But I don't like to do that. I don't like. I don't. We don't want. I want to do things my way. <laughs> but see, that's the whole attitude that we have to shift from. The gospel is a problem. Earlier in Corinthians, Paul talks about how it's a stumbling block to the Jews and a foolishness to the Gentiles. The gospel in and of itself is a problem. So we have to live lives so that the rest of our life doesn't create problems for people. Because it's hard enough to get people to come to Christ. Let's don't make it harder by the way that we live. Going back to 1 Peter, verse 3. He said, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Or, as Hebrews said, God's not ashamed of you because of what you do. Now, some people take this very extreme, and they start saying, oh, see... Women, you shouldn't do your hair up, you shouldn't wear makeup, you shouldn't wear jewelry. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that stuff's not as important as who you are as a person. Who you are inside is the whole point. That's what God is working on. That doesn't mean you just abandon the outside. It just means that don't focus on that. Don't make that the whole thing. Make who you are, as, as I said earlier. It's about, submission is about me. Not the one submitted to. Who am I in this situation? Who are you in this situation? So, I'm going to say this in, uh, in response to this. and kind of sum this up by saying, character matters. Work on the qualities that God thinks are important. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do. Who you are is important. Not just what job you have, not where you live. But who are you? What kind of person are you? And you reveal that by how you treat other people. In uh, 2 Peter, just we just turn the page, in 2 Peter chapter 1, there's this uh, long list of things. Because you might say, well, what are the court character qualities? What is it I'm supposed to do? Well, how am I supposed to live? Look at uh, 2 Peter uh, ver uh, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, for this reason, make every effort. Got work to do. It's not going to just happen. It's not magic. Make every effort. And then he says, to add to your faith. See, we're not talking about how you become a Christian. It's not about, this is an evangelism. You're saved. That's what Peter assumes. Now, what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be adding to your salvation. Adding to your faith. Adding to who God has called you. And then he, these are the things he says. Add to your faith goodness. Just be a good person. And then, to goodness, knowledge. You've got to think about these things. It doesn't just, again, it doesn't just happen. You have to think about, how do I do this? What steps do I take? And to knowledge, let's just skip self-control and go, oh, wait a minute, the next one's persevering. <laughs> and then, God, come on, he starts getting gulped down. It's, to some extent, self-control, and then the second word in there, perseverance, are two of the most common words in the New Testament that we hardly ever talk about. Right. Right. They're, they're always saying it. You have to stay with it. Yeah. Just because you fail this morning doesn't mean you will tomorrow, but you've got to get up tomorrow and do it again. That, that's perseverance. You have to keep doing it. It's not something, oh, whew, I, uh, I served my neighbor today. I'm done for this week. I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> nah, perseverance. Got to do it again tomorrow. Then the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, 
until the holidays come, and then, no, nope, still got to do it. It's still, and then self-control. You have to, I mean, you got to make the choices and then follow through with them. If those two, if we just did those two things, we'd probably be a lot better off as a country, as a church, right. and as people. Right. Self-control. Do what I need to do. Perseverance. Keep doing it. Then he talks about mutual affection and mutual affection, love. <coughs> If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. You know what the implication of that is? Is that there are Christians who are, who are in fact, ineffective and unproductive in their Christian life. Why? Because they're not following through on these things. Oh, I'm saved. I've got Christ. I'm going to heaven. I can just go do whatever I want. And God says, no, 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 I saved you to do these things in your life. And you need to make every effort to do those things. <clears throat> We've got to go back to Peter. We're not done preaching the wives yet. So. <laughs> but I, I, I do want you to notice that all of those things that I'm saying aren't just to women. These are all principles that we all need to follow. And so I need to remind you of that. I mean, I was only partially joking earlier when I told you husbands did because I know you will. And so we need to learn to think of beyond specifics and talk about general principles about life. These apply to everybody, and not just women, not just men. Verse 5. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord, you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Fear of what? Fear that my husband's going to take advantage of that. Fear that, that other people will look down on me. Fear, whatever the fear is, don't give in to that. Instead, follow what God has to say. I, I, I'm not going to do it today because I don't have time to do it, but the reality is I'm not so sure that Sarah is as great an uh, example as this. <laughs> Um, he, she, she does call Abraham her Lord, but she actually doesn't say it out loud, at first of all. And she also calls him old in the same sentence. So um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a double whammy there. But anyway, it's, it's the, the idea, though, is correct in the sense that you know, Abraham got a call from God, and he picked up his whole family and moved to this new country where God was going to lead him. And Sarah went. She went with him. She was just as much a part of that process as he was. And so that's what he's pointing out to. So I'm going to stop for just a second, though, and go to this next thing. Because as I've gone through this whole thing, when we talk about submission, we have the, I just like to say this. We have the yeah, but what about? Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, but what about? What about the, co the government that's persecuting us? Or what about masters who are mean to us? Or what about, what about all the exceptions? Okay, there are exceptions to the rule. And sometimes, but we need to focus on the general principles. Otherwise, we just excuse those and we just don't do them. Because we think, oh, well, the exceptions show that they're not really valid. No, there are exceptions to it. And so some of, some of you ladies might be sitting there right now thinking, well, yes, but what if I'm in an abusive relationship? So let me just say it flat out like this. Women, if you are in an abusive relationship, get out of it now. If your husband is beating on you, if your husband is doing something terrible to you, get away. Just do it. Just get away. We'll deal with other things later. But I just, I want to say that because otherwise people start thinking that I don't recognize that there aren't exceptions. There are exceptions. But we have a general rule, which is submission in relationships. Submission to those around us. Submission to the government. Those are general principles that we need to follow unless there's a specific uh, exceptional reason not to. And so I just want to stop for a second and say I recognize all that. I, I can only remember one time in my pastoral career where I had a woman call me and I didn't know her. She just called out of the blue and she said that her husband was abusive and that she just needed a ride to a bus station so she could get out of town. And I did. 
I don't know what the actual situation was, but I'm not going to try to fix the situation. In that situation, just get out of it and move on. Because that's what you have to do sometimes. And I recognize that. So that's the commercial for uh, recognizing that there are exceptions, but we may need to keep the general principles about what Peter's saying here. So we want to focus on those. So, now, verse 7. Starts off with husbands. So I'm going to say the same thing I said. Now, now husbands, you're supposed to be listening. <laughs> Ladies, think about whatever it is you want to think about for a while. Because I'm talking to the husbands now. Right? You'll notice that... No, I'm not going to point that out. I'm not going to point out that there's eight verses for the women, only one for the men. But you know, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not, no, I'm not pointing that out. It says, husbands, and then he uses the same phrase, in the same way. In the same way that your wives treat the, you, you need to treat them. So husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. But all the in the same way means it's all the same as for the women. It's, it's, it, it, at the time of the, this was written, generally speaking, most marriages would be what you call a covenant marriage or a contract marriage or arranged marriage, right? Sometimes the man and the woman never even knew each other until they got married. But generally speaking, the husbands in the culture, their only responsibility was to provide a home for the wife. That's it. Well, children would be nice and some other things, but generally speaking, right, but the, the interesting thing about the Bible is, is that it turns that around and says, no, 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 you need to be considerate, he says here, as you live with your wives. And the other passages that we talk about in these same things always say, husbands, love your wives. So, I'm going, remember when I said earlier that biblical submission is a voluntary surrender of one's in, own interest to those of another. Let me just take the same definition, but put a different word in there. Okay? Biblical love is a voluntary surrender of one's own interest to those of another. I don't have to like you necessarily, but I do have to set aside my own interest for your interest, and that's what love is. That's a choice. That's a decision on my part to be Consider it, as Peter says here, with their wives, with your wives. The interesting thing about this is Peter says, you know what, men? If your wife submits to you, she's making herself the weaker partner. It's not a value thing. It's just she's taking second place by putting your interest. If you take advantage of that, God says, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't even want you. You can pray all day. It won't matter. That's what it says. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. So I put it like this. Men, if you do not get an answer to your prayers, it could be because of the way you treat your wife. <sighs> so a lot of times we kind of think, no, oh, man, if I pray to God and I pray with faith and, and I say in Jesus' name at the end, he's got to do what I tell him to do, right? Or he's got to do what I ask there are plenty of verses where God says, no, 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 no. If you're not living out these things, you can pray all day, but I'm not listening. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that if you're praying from a, a bad situation. If, if, man, if you take advantage of the fact that your, your wife has chosen to do something in obedience to God, you had better not take advantage of that. You, better, you just better not. God is watching Back to the Hebrews. God is ashamed of husbands that take advantage of their wives. It's not quiet. <laughs> God is ashamed when we don't submit to other people, whether you're a wife or a husband. If you don't get an answer to your prayers, it could be not just the way you treat your wives, but the way you treat your government, the way you treat your masters. The way you treat other people has a direct effect on how and when 
God answers your prayers. Think about that this week. Finally, verse 8, it says this, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. That's not a marriage verse, that is an all you all verse. <laughs> Every, this is how you treat everybody, and that's the challenge we face. Let's pray.